Are you a VFR pilot that hates being grounded just because there's a cloud layer over the airport? Welcome to Sporty's IFR Insights Series, getting the most from your instrument rating. What if you could take off on a day with a 2,000 foot overcast and climb through a few hundred feet of clouds to cruise on top in clear weather? That's what most general aviation IFR is all about. I'm Spencer Suderman. Some of you may remember me from the Sporty's Advanced Pilot Skill Series. I became instrument rated in August of 2000 then earned the CFI rating in 2002 and spent the next 20 years flying air shows in a pit special and making pilots safer by teaching upset recovery and spins. In 2022, I decided to add on the instrument instructor rating to further my goal of making pilots safer. An instrument rating will add new skills that unlock the full potential of your pilot's license. It's demanding, but it's not as hard as some people make it out to be. It requires good training and constant learning. This is not merely a check the box and memorize test questions rating. You need to really learn the material and train your brain to think like an instrument rated pilot. Even if you continue to only fly VFR, you'll become a better aviator. Flying IFR is fun, easier than ever before, and perhaps the most rewarding thing you can do in aviation, like aerobatics for the brain. Today's digital tools, like GPS with moving map display, apps on an iPad, ABSB receivers, and autopilots, make single pilot IFR flying much safer and more manageable compared to decades ago when I first became instrument rated. At that time, all we had were VORs, Loran, ADF receivers, and paper charts. In this episode of Sporty's IFR Insights, we're gonna fly an RNAV approach into Northeast Florida Regional Airport in St. Augustine during actual IFR conditions. This is a great example of how an instrument approach allows you to transition through a ragged layer of clouds with rain showers to the destination airport for landing. Most people think instrument approaches are always flown to minimums in dense fog or 200 foot ceilings, but that is rarely the case. The video starts with a complete approach plate briefing. However, if you wanna go directly to the in-flight action, just click ahead. In ForeFlight, tap on the flight plan button, then start typing the identifiers for the departure and arrival airports, and ForeFlight draws a direct course on the map. Then tap the Procedure button, then select the Approach button to bring up the Approaches tab, then select RNAV GPS Runway 13 to bring up the transitions. ForeFlight shows the most anticipated flight path given the departure point, and this makes sense since after takeoff, Approach Control will vector us to the initial approach fix. Select ORSOF, then tap Add to Route. Now the entire flight is shown on the map screen with the approach plate overlaid. Another tap on the flight plan button to close that screen, then pinch zoom the approach plate to the full screen. Now let's brief the approach top to bottom and left to right. First we check the date to ensure this approach plate is current. Next we check the location. This is St. Augustine, Florida, Northeast Florida Regional, RNAV, runway 13. Notice the final approach course is 130 degrees. The runway length for landing is 6,144 feet, which is plenty for a Cessna 172. The touchdown zone elevation is 10 feet. Moving down to the notes, we see a T and a black triangle, which means there are IFR takeoff minimums and or departure procedures in section L of the terminal procedures publication. Since today's flight will be conducted with an IFR clearance in instrument meteorological conditions with return to Craig, I'll review the TPP. There is also an A in a black triangle, which means there are alternate minimums, which apply when using this airport and approach as an alternate when filing an IFR flight plan. Since this airport is the primary destination, this won't apply. However, I will need to file an alternate in case I can't land here. The actual notes mainly contain altimeter setting availability and how that could affect minimums for the approach. The last box on the row is the missed approach procedure. All missed approaches start with a climb, and this one is to 2,000 feet straight ahead, then direct to Yutka and hold as pictured in the lower right corner of the plan view section. Moving down to the next row are the frequencies in the order they are needed. First you get the ATIS, then talk to approach for the clearance and advisories, then get handed off to tower for landing. Plan view section is next, and this is a top-down look at the approach. One of my favorite things about ForeFlight and this graphical overlay is how easy it is to understand the flight path throughout the entire approach. The magenta line is our arrival from the northwest to Orsoff, which must be crossed no lower than 2,100 feet. 
This won't be a straight line during the actual flight, as radar vectors will be given to this initial approach fix. After crossing Orsov, we can descend no lower than 2,000 feet to cross the intermediate fix called Tanju, where we turn on to the final approach course of 130 degrees and start a descent to 1,600 feet to cross the final approach fix Uduzo. After Uduzo, we can descend to the LNAV MDA of 460 feet, and as long as there is at least one mile of visibility, we can continue, but not descend, until the runway environment is in sight. The next section is the profile view, which has the same information as the plan view, just presented looking at the airplane from the side as it flies the approach. The distances for each segment are shown at the bottom and improve situational awareness for comparison to the GPS distance on the primary flight display. The bottom section shows the minimums for the different versions of the approach. We'll be flying a Cessna 172 in the approach at under 90 knots, so that puts us in category A, and this plane is not WAS equipped, therefore we will use the LNAV minimums. Now let's go up to 2,000 feet heading southeast over Jacksonville, Florida, about to begin the approach after IFR departure and vectors from Craig Airport. Number four, Mike Victor, you are four miles from Orsoff, cross Orsoff uh, at or above 2,000, third RNAV, runway 13 approach. Cross Orsoff at or above 2,000 for RNAV 13 approach, 814, Mike Victor. Number four, Mike Victor, did you pick up the weather at St. Augustine? I'm showing information alpha current. I have information alpha for St. Augustine, 814, Mike Victor. Thank you. Number four, Mike Victor, contact tower 127.62. We'll see you in a minute. 127.62 for 814, Mike Victor. See you in a bit. Take six, contact Jack's approach. St. Augustine Tower, Seth 814, Mike Victor, 2100 on the uh, RNAV for 13. Number 814, Mike Victor, St. Augustine Tower, continue for runway 13. Continue for runway 13 for 814, Mike Victor. Pro pilots got the airplane in approach mode. Monitoring everything. And across Tunzu at 2,000 feet. On the Garmin turn left to 133 in six seconds, five seconds. Autopilot should do that for me. So I'm inside of Tunzu, I can descend to 1,600 feet to cross a Duzo. The airplane turning. See on the map how it nicely rounded inside the corner. But I'm on the final approach course and get down to 1600. Not an easy 400 feet a minute. The final approach segment, this is an LNAV approach, or 60 LNAV minima. What I'll do is I'll set the uh, autopilot to 500, keep us just above it. Point one to a Duzo. It's a little snotty down here. There's a one four Mike Victor, runway one three, clear to land. Runway one three, clear to land for four Mike Victor. Uh, we're four and a half miles to the airport. I can now start a descent down to 460. I'm going to put 500 in the autopilot. I'm going to set a vertical descent speed of 500 feet a minute. Power is out. Configured for the approach. 80 for 500. You're flying a LNAV, which is equivalent to a non precision VOR type approach. 100 for 500. Your step-down minimums are clearly identified on the approach plate. However, how fast or how slowly you get down there is up to you as the pilot. If you had a lower ceiling, you might want to descend quicker, get below the cloud, start looking for the runway. I have 60. Fixes do have a minimum crossing altitude. You cannot be lower than that altitude when you cross minimum. the fix. Minimum. And that's typically for obstruction of clearance. And at the autopilot, I have the runway in sight. Wind check. Wind 2005. For this flight, I planned a full stop landing, then taxi back to the active runway with a short ground delay to reconfigure the G1000, then take off and head back to Craig Airport. This keeps the IFR flight plan active. 
If this were the final destination, then Tower would close the flight plan automatically after landing. The flight is not over until the plane is off the runway at a full stop. Stay focused on the landing throughout the touchdown and rollout. Avoid overbraking, as that could lock up the main wheels and cause skidding and hydroplaning if the runway is wet. If you don't make the first turn off, just roll down to the next one. Thanks for riding along, and I hope this flight gave you a feel for what instrument flying is all about. To take the next step, check out Sporty's instrument rating course, which includes 13 hours of in-flight HD cross-country and instrument approach video training and comprehensive written test preparation tools. You can learn more about the course, as well as find a large collection of new articles, videos, quizzes, and podcasts, all geared towards IFR flying at sporties.com IFR. And if you're like me from a few years ago, these resources are a great way to get current too if you have an instrument rating and are out of practice. Fly safe.